have no apologies. Um, Robbie has indicated he has to leave at six, and uh, me are leaving early at ten to six. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Some, someone, the we'll, rest of us will be here till about midnight. <laughs> no, we won't. Uh, no apologies. No, uh, any conflicts of interest? Thank you, none. Confirmation of minutes from um, October. Somebody like to move? Wendy moves, Robbie seconds. I'll put those for recommendation. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. Any matters arising from them? No, everybody happy? Thank you. We move on to item five, deputations. Um, we're reversing the order here a wee bit. Um, Richard's got to get away, so we're doing um, 5.2 ahead of 5.1. Gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I won't dwell too long because most of you already uh, know Richard uh, Lindsay, who's chair of RSL Consulting. Um, Richard's basically updated our plan for our sports facilities plan, which was done originally for the last LTP. Um, so Richard's going to talk through that today, plus also he's updated the Sioux Sutherland report around the Pegasus uh, Ravenswood Northwood End community facility provision. Um, so Richard's also going to be talking through that as well. So just mindful of time, so I'll hand straight over to you, sir. Thanks, Grant. Uh, kia ora, Koto. Um, I'm going to race through the uh, sports facility plan uh, in about 10 minutes, and then we'll spend the second 10 minutes on the uh, Pegasus Wood End Ravenswood uh, study. So hopefully this thing will work for me. Which way do I point it? Just the big button. Yep, press that one. Should matter. Not matter. Did work before. Got the laser still on. I can probably just talk to this anyway, so um, we don't really need a PowerPoint, but... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Okay. Um, I'll just... No. Uh, essentially, uh, the 2020 Sports Facility Plan is a update and refresh of a document developed in 2017 to look at the uh, issues and opportunities around sport and, well, sport facilities in the WIMAC. Uh, my summary of that, oh, it is up there now. Uh, it, my, my short version is that the Waimakariri district is well served with uh, sporting facilities. Uh, and uh, the key focus uh, should be on retaining uh, and enhancing the level of service of a lot of those facilities. So in the report, uh, we've, we've outlined uh, discussions with stakeholders uh, and clubs, trying to understand needs, etc. Um, I'll just flip to a, a graph. This, this graph here um, shows the, the purple line at the top uh, relates to the axes on the right, which is the Waimakariri population and the growth. Uh, and the other three lines are, are scenarios of sports club membership. Uh, and I do this to look at what proportion of people uh, in the WIMAC are participating in sports clubs. Uh, and the, currently, uh, most sports clubs are reporting to us that membership is relatively stable. And I say relatively stable, some are up a few, some are down a few but relatively stable. Uh, the exceptions being uh, trampolining report uh, significant growth year on year uh, through participations through the door, not membership, and rugby league uh, in this survey have reported an increase of uh, some, somewhere in the vicinity of 40 odd people. Um, you have to remember this is self-reporting, so um, you know, we have to take people uh, on their word. Now, the, these three scenarios, the, the blue line shows the, the membership of people in, involved in sports clubs uh, staying relatively static. And I guess that shows a picture, the proportion of people involved in sports clubs over a lengthy period of time uh, is, is declining. Uh, and I don't like saying that because I'm involved in sport, but the reality is uh, there is a decline in a number of uh, traditional sporting codes. Uh, that said, there is an increase in some other sporting codes. 
but overall it's relatively stable. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, it means that we need to look at other ways of catering for people as well. Um, so maintaining the level of service that we have uh, across a number of codes but also looking at what other activities are people participating in. Uh, and then we look at the demographics of the WiMAC and we look at the population growth and we also look at the ageing population in the WiMAC and what, which activities uh, do the elderly um, or older people want to participate in over time. Um, because all the research shows that once you have more discretionary time, uh, you try to seek out uh, things such as you know reducing your golf handicap or getting better at um, croquet or, or golf or other activities. Um, but so that's that's just a useful bit of information. I'll just cut to the chase. Um, we it was out of scope of the report, but we thought it was really important to let people know that a number of people participate in what we call active informal activities. Uh, far more than what they participate in sports. So a challenge we were putting out in the plan is how can we ensure we, uh, we provide for people uh, in, in the Waimakariri? Uh, simple things like uh, additional um, uh, pick up basketball courts, um, more and more opportunities for people to walk and cycle. We know that walking is the largest form of physical activity uh, in the country uh, by a long way. Um, but also when we're developing our sporting facilities, ensuring that when they're developed, uh, they meet the needs of our older audience as well. So they are warm, they're heated, uh, acoustically they're acceptable, so they can spectate and watch grandchildren, etc. So making uh, facilities more accessible for people is, is something uh, to, to look at going forward. So some key uh, recommendations uh, I mentioned before. Uh, that you've got a strong base of sporting facilities. There are no significant asset gaps, uh, and clearly the main power stadium is filling one of those gaps, which uh, it will open next year. Population, alone, population growth alone will not increase participation levels based on what we know from the past. Uh, so sports are going to need to do something different uh, to increase uh, the number of people participating in sport and recreation. Uh, and increasing the quality of sports fields and facilities uh, is, is something we think the WIMAC district needs to focus on. Uh, we, we, we've put a recommendation in the report about ensuring there is some capital to uh, enhance main power oval when it opens. And if you think about any uh, building that's generally constructed in New Zealand, there is a bit of tweaking required uh, once it's open. Uh, we're not talking huge numbers, we're just talking around the edges to enhance it and make sure that people use it as much as possible. Uh, closely monitor the court. Uh, we're, we're, all, we're getting feedback from some of the ball codes that it's going to be at peak uh, use as soon as it opens. Uh, my challenge to the sector is we still need to take a network approach to indoor courts. We've still got a large number of school courts uh, that can be used etc. So some towns and cities look at a rotation type system where you get to play on the top courts every second or third week and then you're rotated to others. So um, we need to be really careful that we, we don't overcapitalise. So monitor that use. Uh, monitor the use of the network of courts and then make a decision. So in my language, let's take a breath. Let's enjoy the indoor stadium when it opens, um, but don't rush to the next stage. Happy to take, yep, yep. Um, as an example, badminton has largely disappeared from Waimakuriri. Um, how do we stop the really popular sports that are there now, like basketball, not just booking out the indoor court completely when there are sports who have to re-establish in the district? It's a really good question and I guess the, the network of facilities, uh, there will be surplus space in other halls that they will be able to capitalise on. Uh, other uh, towns and cities around the country look at um, apportioning a percentage of time to minority sports, um, but that's really a management issue that will be dealt with through the North Canterbury Sport and Rec Trust. 
through the North Canterbury Sport and Rec Trust because that was going to be my question. So who's going to put together these drawers and book the Ahoka School Hall and yep. the Southbrook New Life Hall, etc.? Yep. Who's going to do that? Yeah, th so that's the, the decision of the North Canterbury Sport and Rec Trust with the sporting codes. So when they can use Coldstream and when they'll need to use other venues, yeah. Um, um, there, are, there are a few more recommendations in the report. There's nothing uh, significant from a capital perspective except you need to allow for replacement or renewal of the artificial turfs in the next 10 years. So that's, that's in the report. I'm very mindful of time, uh, so I'm going to go on to the next report now, and, and if we've got time in the end, I can um, ask, you know, answer any any questions. Oh, Robbie. In a report later on, there's a $50,000 sum mentioned for lights at Mandeville. Mm. I, I'm sitting there wondering, we've got Kendall, mm. football not currently paying their bills. Why are we not pushing off people who might use Mandeville to Kendall, which is you know, less than 10 minutes away. Yep. Um, yeah, good question, uh, Robbie. Um, we've had a look at some other sports that might be able to utilise Kendall. Um, we're going to have to do a lot more work with some of those uh, codes and certainly with football as well. They've had another change in their committee, so their chair and treasurer that we've been working with for the past year have both stood down. Um, so look, that club has had um, just change upon change, so it's 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 uh, a, a problem for us because obviously the modelling for the artificial turf at Kendall Park was based on them paying us and paying back into the depreciation fund. Um, that's just simply not occurring, um, which is a real problem in terms of then going to be able to fund the renewal of the of the artificial turf. In terms of moving some of the other sports, rugby and rugby league have been a little bit uh, reluctant. Um, some of those sports that would utilise lights there, uh, the IRB accreditation has become really difficult for us in terms of the um, playability of the artificial turf. They could potentially train there um, if they wanted to. Certainly some of the social teams could train there and kids could train there. Um, so there is definitely more conversations needed around that to try and push rugby that way. Um, and I think if, if I may briefly just say something that myself and Richard have spoken about, one of the reasons that we're seeing some of the edge sports kind of now edging out some of the more traditional sports is because they're willing to um, offer a different product. And when I say product, they're offering a Thursday night comp or they're offering a Friday night comp. It's not just your traditional Saturday and Sunday. So they're actually starting to see that they're mopping up some of the people who otherwise want to keep their weekends free. Um, and we're starting to see that across the, across the parks with, with some of the sports as well. So yeah, I just made a, a final comment around active recreation and ensuring uh, there are opportunities in the YMAC. So I'll quickly go on to the Pegasus Ravenswood Community Facilities Needs and Options Report. So this report was commissioned um, to review the Sioux Southern Report of 2018-19 uh, with, with a purpose uh, an independent assessment of the need for additional community facilities in the district to primarily service uh, Pegasus, Wood End, Ravenswood communities. And I guess my language around uh, Wood End and Ravenswood is probably uh, more around Wood End generally. Um, once they're combined, I think they're, they're going to become a, you know, a town in their own right. Um, so just looking at this uh, report, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the, the people from the Pegasus Community Centre here have provided great information. Um, so there were, there's previously adopted levels of service that council signed off uh, in a meeting, I think it's the 18th of January 2018, which says that uh, the council is going to provide library services for urban populations of 10,000 people or more uh, and community meeting spaces for communities with a population of 2,500 or more. Uh, so I used that as a premise for um, our assessment. Uh, the Pegasus Community Centre first is, currently provides for a range of user groups, so you know there's an identified uh, need there, it's operating. There's two lease spaces, uh, both due to expire June 2025, 
Uh, the total uh, operating expenditure is approximately 70 or 71,000. It's, it's in the report. Uh, any community facility developed in Pegasus, uh, we think there's an opportunity to combine it uh, with the current studies that the council's doing around youth activity area. Uh, that would make sense to have some sort of synergy there. And uh, I personally believe if it was next to the lake, uh, and the lake uh, was a lake, then there would be opportunities for additional events to occur uh, in the WIMAC. Uh, and particularly, um, you know, different lake user groups, etc., ac accessing that space. So we, we've 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 identified that uh, a space required in Pegasus, approximately 385, but that that would change over over a design period, um, up or down, whatever. But a preliminary estimate of capital cost for that type of facility would be in the vicinity of 2.12. I think the report says 2.5, uh, excluding land, uh, fit out uh, professional fees. And we, we looked at the locations uh, that were assessed for the youth activity area around the centre of Pegasus, and we felt that 70 Motu Key was uh, the most ideally located. Uh, there, are, there are another couple of sites there as well. Remembering that this, this is a draft report and we're, we're still sort of looking at that in a bit more detail. Has anyone got any questions about the Pegasus Community Centre before I go on to the uh, the other wider community library slash community centre? Sorry, I'm not particularly spatial. Can you give us an idea of what 385 square metres means, like in, perhaps in comparison to, say, the Wooding Community Centre? Do you know that facility? Yeah, well, I, well, I, 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 as an example, a, a netball court, if you're wanting some spatial, uh, that's 30.5 uh, metres by 15.25, so it's about 450 square metres. Yep. Yeah, and, and it would include a, a larger function space, uh, some smaller meeting spaces. But, but fairly functional, and we're saying it doesn't need to be large because you would access larger facilities elsewhere in the district. Right, so you, you would go to the likes of this town hall or, or larger meeting spaces for, for those types of activities. Similar question actually, so the size of the current facility that we've got leased, mm, mm. around that sort of size? Yeah, is that I think I, I, it's approximate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Slightly, slightly it's, it's 300 plus storage. Yes, yes, yes. it's about similar size. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. So the, the next part of the study is we looked at the level of service around uh, <coughs> libraries uh, and the population stats show that the 10,000, magical 10,000 people mark will um, arrive somewhere around 2040 uh, based on stats we were provided by the council and I've got a plus or minus there because they're only projections we don't know uh, sometimes things grow quicker uh, but the important thing here is it's still a wee way away and from a library perspective things can change quite a lot in 20 years uh, in fact the best way to think about that is go back 20 years and look what a library was like I'm sure it was a lot different to what it is now um, so we need to think and be mindful of that in our, uh, our planning. Um, so I, I guess from our perspective it's important to secure land for these types of assets early, um, so you've then got the option. If you don't secure land, and, and I guess I could also speak for um, another report that's coming up later on around aquatic facilities, if you're going to develop these facilities in the future, um, you need to land bank now, so then you've got some options uh, in the future. For the community library, uh, we, we looked at several uh, options around how that could be met. Uh, this is a larger space. Uh, the recommendation was around 750 square metres, and you could lease a commercial building if it was built. Um, that's the 20 minutes. <laughs> You could lease, purchase land and build, uh, or you could use existing uh, YMAP District Council sites. Uh, and we looked at a few of those as well. Um, 
we once again think that there's synergies in creating this type of space adjacent to other community facilities. It's an absolute no-brainer in terms of shared services, car parking, etc., and potentially reception. Um, and there are some uh, significant dependencies around this project. Uh, the Wood End Bypass, I believe, will hopefully change the nature of central Wood End and turn it back into a hamlet slash village, and people will become feel comfortable walking around the area a lot more, etc. And so it could be a really nice community space. Preliminary capital estimate, uh, based on the 750 square metres, uh, 4.8 to $6 million. So that's my 20 minutes. Great. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, councillors and committee members, thank you for the opportunity for us to address you about the function and the future of the men's shed. I'll start with a brief history. The Kaipoi men's shed grew out of the need for a place for men to get together to support each other and the Kaipoi community after the destructive earthquakes of 2010 and 2011. Initial gatherings were informal and held in the garage and workshop of one of our early members, an engineer. As the group grew, this could not be sustained and sponsorship and a site were found. Our shed is on the grounds of Sutton's, the old Patience and Nicholson factory, and they also provide us with our power, so it's a lovely sponsorship. Sutton's Australia has a strong link with men's sheds and organisations in Australia. Sarah donated a double garage, but when the members arrived to move the building, it had disappeared, purloined by somebody else. However, another building was found, and early in 2014, a three-bay garage was moved from Cass Street to the Dale Street site of Sutton's. The shed was lined, insulated, wired, including three-phase power, installed, painted, and prepared for the grand opening on the 15th of July, 2014. An extension to house a compressor, dust extraction system, wood turning lathes, a veranda has been added to the north side of the shed. Two containers were added to house the metal workshop and the paint shop and the timber store. The two containers were subsequently covered by a permanent roof and the space between enclosed to become a dedicated paint shop. So what do we do? Well, the men's shed are a mixed bunch. The movement started in Australia, where there are currently over 900 sheds. It is now in the UK, Ireland, the USA, Canada, Finland and Greece. Here in New Zealand there are 118 sheds and 30 in Canterbury. Some sheds started as coffin clubs. There are nurseries. One is restoring a historic building. Some are mainly woodworking. Many have metal workshop. Some do electronics and in Ashburton they build 3D printers. Some like Kaipoi are open a couple of days a week and some are open every day. The shed is what its members want it to be. In Kaiapoi we do a lot of woodwork, mainly for the community. There is scope for the members to do their own work, although many have a good workshop at home, and only bring work to the shed to have access to specialised or precision tools. In the last three years we have built flat pack aviaries for dock, large picnic tables for several schools, these have seating all the way round. Build a market stand for a country school, theatre flats for the local high school, made the daffodils for Kaiapoi, which you've all seen. 
computer trolleys for a local school, grave crosses for a church cemetery and for the RSA, frames for the Kaipoi food forest, cat enclosures converting patios to catios. Raised garden beds, shade houses, half-side road signs for a play centre to teach children road safety. Disability access ramps, a beehive, giant Connect Four gender and coits games, standard and disability access picnic tables for the council, coffins, chocolate wheel for the battered woman's trust, refurbished beds for a local charity rehousing families that come through the battered woman's trust. Large outdoor toy boxes for low place, local play centres. Shed for ride on mower, teaching aids, shelves, mud kitchens and outdoor resources for local preschools and kindergartens. Rabbit jumps for the local bunny fanciers. And in case you don't believe me, there is a Rabbit Olympics. <laughs> they have serious meetings where you've seen the dogs do the dog show. This is with rabbits. Hurdles, obstacles, you may well say, and more coffins. So, on top of this, there are many, many small repair jobs, from refurbishing garden bench seats, of which you've done half a dozen to date, repairing fences, changing light bulbs, small jobs for the RSA, and the list goes on. Each job is handled in a professional way, with a job sheet containing job details and client details. And these job sheets, this is two years' worth. Okay, so we've done a fair amount of work. But the best thing about our shed, and I have to emphasize this, our shed, we come to go together two mornings a week to spend three or four hours in a stage, in a state of managed chaos, to work on community projects, enjoy each other's company, maintain a social network, and do what blokes enjoy doing and do best working collaboratively on projects in a non-competitive environment. We only want two mornings a week, no more, and we go happy as. We don't ask for more, and nor do our partners. So the men, their families, and the wider community, the shed is a source of social connection, great for mental health and support, and a huge source of practical skills that the community can tap into and benefit from. In the last three years, the membership has grown quietly, and before the coronavirus lockdown, there would be up to 35 at a Tuesday workshop and up to 25 on Thursdays. Can you imagine 35 blokes inside a space probably smaller than this room? Okay, with all the power tools and all the noise and all the hubbub, so it's pretty exciting. At the moment, after the lockdown, the numbers are not quite the same and not as steady, with about 24 to 30 members at both Tuesday and Thursday workshop. Last year there were 51 paid up members and to date this year it is 41. At the moment, when it is morning tea time, we have to clear space on a work table to put out cups. This interferes with workflow. All the administration work is also carried out in the workshop. Consequently, we are now struggling with space and the safety issues associated with people getting in the way. Our workshop is hard up against the Sutton factory cafeteria, and one of the constraints connected with occupying this site is that when the factory staff are having coffee or lunch break, we have to turn off all our noisy power tools. As the staff has breaks and shifts, this results in three stoppages in our morning work. 9.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.45. We are currently preparing a clean space with a serving hatch and a kitchen to serve morning teas, space for administration, files, library, notice boards, and shelving to store products like toys, games, and other items made by the men. This is a temporary solution to our space problem, but will enable us to reconfigure the machines in the workshop and make it a safer place to work. The other constraint that the space limit puts on our growth is that we are not able to add to the diversity of activities available to our members. There are sheds involved in running plant nurseries. Some have well-developed metal workshops, electronics, wood turning, 
painting, or like I've said before, Ashburton building 3D printers. And although some sheds are open every day, and Kaipoi is open only two days a week, this is how the members want it, as this is how they manage to keep in touch with each other. The shed is what the members want it to be, but if a member new or old wants to branch out, we have no space to offer them. It would not even be possible to offer the shed for other activities on other days, as the workshop is full with large tools like saws and workbenches, all utilised for projects. There is no way to make space by storing the projects, as there is nowhere to store them. Many projects have to remain under the veranda during the week when members are not present. So the Kaipoi Community Hub. The members of the Kaipoi Men's Shed are of all ages, although most are retired, we have a range of skills including teaching, engineering, painting, carpenter, manager, builder, butcher, electrician, scientist, cabinet maker, welder, fitter and boat builder. The members are very sociable with a streak of independence, a sprinkling of mischief and enjoy in sharing their skills, in a workshop environment helping each other and working for the benefit of the community. While we are working to create a temporary solution to the space constraints that we operate under, this is a bridging step and we are very keen to find a permanent location with the capacity for growth and without the constraint that we face at the moment on the use of power tools. Consequently, working with the Waimakariri District Council to redevelop the red zone as a space for community organisations like the Crokey Club, Men's Shed and Food Security Base is for the Men's Shed an amazing opportunity to secure a long-term future. Even though this is realistically about three years away, we are fully committed to the project. We are aware that operating without the sponsorship provided by Sutton's on their factory site will present new challenges. However, there is nothing that the members have not handled before. This is the beauty and advantage of the collective experience of many mature and senior members. We can do it all. We've done it. For the Kaipo community to have this resource of skilled and dedicated people, concentrated under one roof, able to assist in many ways, including mentoring, is an opportunity to be grasped and developed. With this opportunity before us, the Men's Shed will do what it can to help the hub develop and hope that the Makariri District Council can see its way to support this exciting community project with the expertise of its staff and support it all financially. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Comprehensive presentation there. Any Quickly, any questions? Remembering that we'll be discussing the hub in the next item on the agenda. You've said it all, sir. Thank you. I just wish I could bottle the madness and bring it here. <laughs> okay. Next up, Crokey. We have Jan and Brian and in supporters. Mr Chairman, councillors and staff, I'm Jan Chisnell, the President of the Kaiapoi Croquet Club and today I'm supported by Brian White, one of our members. Brian's going to talk on the building side of it and I'm going to talk on the social side. So Brian, would you like to go forward? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The existing facility at the end of uh, Raven Quay has performed steering service for over 100 years. Right. However, the earthquakes of 10 years ago caused problems which have only been partially repaired. The current facility is undersized, it's past its best and in need of repair and upgrade. And the club has continued to soldier on in the hope that something better will eventuate. 
The proposed site on the corner of Courtney Drive and Charter Street is an excellent greenfield site for the club's purposes. It's got a good location, it's easy to find and it's close to amenities. And the site is level and well drained and ultimately will provide good quality playing surfaces. And also there's ample land to allow for expansion over time. And the letter of intent from the council from October set out the council offer which is essentially site works and boundary fencing, uh, council services to the boundary, uh, two operational full-sized irrigated croquet lawns and fees and support for resource and building consents. So the major effort by the club is the buildings which is a new clubhouse and an equipment come mower shed. Proposed designs envisage that the single level structure will be residential style and fit in with the location. It will be of sufficient size to cater for the expanded club membership in future years and kitchen and amenities to enable functions associated uh, with club activities and of course fundraising. Preliminary costings have been attained for this work and clearly fundraising will be required which will involve on our part club activities such as club fun days, twilight and corporate events and public open days. Uh, also donations and grants from established providers interested in sport and community well-being. And any shortfall will be covered by a loan. But the time frame envisaged uh, from obtaining the green light from council, hopefully, and relocating from Raven Quay to Courtney Drive is some two to three years in that region. And that's ample time for the club to perform its obligations. So the proposal now before council provides an opportunity for a new start, which is what, really what we're looking for. Club members accept that there are challenges ahead. There's a lot of hard work, but are excited at the prospect of new facilities which will improve the playing experience, materially assist the club to grow, enable greater numbers to participate in the game of croquet and the social activity associated with that. Thank you very much. My turn. <laughs> the Kaipoi Croquet Club has served the people of Kaipoi for about 115 years. During that time, it has had membership highs and lows, going from eight members to 29 at present, with three pending. As a club, we are aware of the government's wish to include well-being in all aspects of life. We're doing our best to incorporate this into our croquet club. Connectedness. Croquet is a game for all ages, the very young, the middle-aged and the elderly. It's very kind to ageing bones. Minimal equipment is needed. Soft shoes, a sun hat, a mallet, a ball and a hoop. And you're off. To encourage new members, we lend mallets and give free six free sessions. We have open days to show the community what croquet is all about and we gather up new members on those days. Giving. Our club is a team and together we work as a team, both at the club and off the club. I mean away from club days. Loud encouragement is given to those who execute a good shot. Quiet advice is given to those who are struggling a little. Members and their families give time to keep our club going by painting, mowing, cleaning, hedge trimming and general tasks about the grounds. Our grounds actually are a credit to the club. Being active. Croquet is a very active game. It's stimulating both mentally and physically. You need to be able to anticipate and plan every move. It's a game, a game as I said before, that's gentle on ageing limbs. Age is not a barrier. And our lawns are available to members to use at any time. Social connections. We encourage our team to participate in inter-club and club competitions. We meet together each club day for afternoon tea and for the occasional meal. Friendships are made through club connections. Social isolation is a concern, but Kaipoi keeps an eye on its members. Phone calls, a note or a visit is made to those who are unwell or have been absent for a while. Keep learning. 
the team is kept informed of all opportunities to further their croquet skills. Recently we had coaching in the subtleties of the game and another on the croquet New Zealand rules. This, mean our team, this means our team is playing to exactly the same rules as every other team in New Zealand. We always bring away new ideas when playing into club competitions. Health and safety. Our team is aware of health and safety requirements. All hazards are labelled. Members wear information regarding health, next of kin and so on on the reverse of their name tags. We have a COVID sign-in available for all who enter our club rooms. In conclusion, croquet is a game for all ages and is to be encouraged. Equipment is loaned to new players. Social interaction plays a very important role. Fun, laughter and friendly banter is often heard from the players. Physical movement is important as we age and inter-club visiting forms important social connections. We fulfil many of the wellbeing suggestions and are more than just a croquet club. Our role in Kaiapoi is very important in keeping people physically and mentally active, socially connected and out of doctors' waiting rooms. Recently I held a vote regarding the future of the club, using Chris Brown's letter with the options set out and asked the team to vote on whether to move or not. The vote was 99% for, with one dissension. Some members are still concerned about finances, but the Mayor spoke to us and reassured us about this. We thank the Mayor and councillors and staff. <laughs> he might give us a loan. <laughs> we thought you were going to give us a private loan. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> We thank the Mayor, Councillors and staff of the Waimakariri District Council for their time, support and encouragement as we face an exciting future on our planned move to new facilities. Thank you. Jen, thank you, thank you both very much for this. I'm just wondering when, while you, when you are preparing and getting ready for your move, have you um, talked to the Rangiora ones about how they have set about doing the uh, the grounds and how they fundraised and all the rest of it, have you? Yes, we have. That's excellent. Well done, because no good reinventing the wheel, no, is it? not at not. Mm. Thank you, Jan. Very nice to see you again, and Brian. Um, just a question. We've heard just from the men's shed just previously, and looking at the locations, they're kind of the furthest away. You guys are in the middle, and then the food for us food um, security place would be next to the residential area. Do you have any concerns about the noise from the men's shed uh, being at Croquet? Are, you, are your members happy to allow, as that's another community activity um, taking place next to you? Not at all worried. All good? Um, you thank know, you. if they, if we, we could use different days, it's not really going to be a problem at all. Sure, thank mm -hmm. you. Our existing facilities next door to Rugby League Club. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Thank you for inviting us everyone. Um, I'm Steph, I'm the manager at Satisfy Food Rescue and also a key stakeholder in the Food Secure North Canterbury group. Here I have one of our lovely trustees, Anne Barnes, who's joining me today, and Rachel Thornton. Um, I'd like to um, start by talking a little bit about Satisfy Food Rescue and what we do. Uh, we are currently rescuing food from six supermarkets across the district, out to Amberley, Rangiora, Kaiapoi, Mandeville. We collect weekly, Monday to Friday, each morning, and as part of those collections, we um, muster a team of volunteers that come and help us with the work that we do. We've been operational since 2015, and um, started with one supermarket back in 2016. We had a very small space as part of the Kaipoi Community Centre and that space in itself would have been around 25 to 30 square metres in size and the volume of food that we were processing each morning 
uh, was incredible. If you could see the space, you would be very surprised. The um, types of food that we're rescuing are bread, bakery, produce, meat, which is frozen, dairy items, basically anything that is very close to its use by date or can't be sold in the supermarkets. We take it. It doesn't go to the pigs. We get it to humans and people who are in need. The space that we were in was too small for us. Prior to lockdown, we were rescuing around six to eight tonnes of food per month, which is enormous, creating many meals for many families in the district. We were very fortunate as part of the um, Ministry for Social Development funding that Food Secure North Canterbury secured to be able to put some money aside for two years rental in a larger space, which is around 240 square metres. It's a warehouse with an office space at the front. Post lockdown and during lockdown, our volumes grew between um, from six to eight tonnes per month up to 15 tonnes. And we were able to get that out through our um, stakeholders and um, recipient organisations, 27 of which were coming to collect food on a daily basis. We've moved into the new space and we currently are still collecting around, on average, 12 tonnes of food per month. So the, the growth has been sustained. And I believe uh, there are a number of factors in, in, um, that are contributing towards that. The um, Airtea Food Rescue Alliance, which has been established this year, will be supporting food rescue organisations across New Zealand. In addition, the New Zealand Food Network um, are rescuing food across the country and actually creating a South Island hub, which will mean that we get more food more regularly. And we're already seeing that coming in by the pallet load each week, which is I think this week we're expecting about four pallets that are coming just directly from the New Zealand Food Network, which is out with of our usual collections. The, um, I think the other thing is that businesses are more mindful post um, lockdown about the amount of food that, that can easily go to waste and the number of, feed, number of people that do actually need food in the district that don't have food security. Um, another interesting fact is that the World Food Programme, um, Food Security, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2020. So I think looking to our community and ensuring food security in the district is quite important. I'd just like to tell you a couple of things about our um, organisation. The, the volunteers that we have, around a bank of um, 40 of those, we've got really high volunteer retention. We feel that they are an integral part of what we do. We really couldn't do the work that we do without them. Um, and in addition, the organisations that we support with the food range from food banks across the district to local schools um, for their breakfast and lunch clubs to community soup kitchens to um, community lunch programmes helping reduce social isolation. And I think that's all from me at the moment. Oh, you want me to? Right. So we talk about our volunteers because they're very valuable. But um, I've been, yeah, I've been part of Satisfy Food Rescue for nearly four years. I was their first employee. Um, they secured funding for 10 hours a week. And that was coming up four years ago now. I'm now one of a team of four people. We have a driver who um, collects the food every day. She works 10 hours a week. Um, we also have uh, Michelle, our distributions coordinator. So she works with the recipient organisations, making sure that we're meeting their needs and that none of the food that we give to them goes to waste. And in addition, just recently, we've employed Cameron Crawley and he is our operations coordinator who's in our office for 25 hours a week, making sure that we are um, getting the food out to where it needs to go and that we are um, operationally sound. Anything else, Anne? No. Rachel, is there anything else you want me to add? So in terms of, um, I'll put my Food Secure North Canterbury hat on now. So in, in terms of the, um, the community hub in Kaipoi and what it will mean for Satisfy, uh, it will mean um, that we can collaborate within our community to make sure that we are uh, meeting the needs of those organisations that need the food. So um, a lot of the um, food banks, in, in addition, 
um, anyone else in the in the community, like the um, Kaipoi Food Forest, uh, and all the other trusts that we're going to be working with, that we can make sure that we are um, meeting meeting the need really. It's. I think the. Uh, sorry, just one more thing. I think the the realization of this new bigger space that we've got, we've actually almost outgrown it, and. It's incredible to think that we can jump from 30 square metres to 240 square metres and suddenly we're, you know, we actually need more space. But we really need um, somewhere that's fit for purpose. I think it's not the type of thing that you can just go and find a facility that, that we can rent readily. So I think the, the food, uh, sorry, the community hub in Kaipoi would, would probably tick a, a huge box there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, just clarifying with this food source, North Canterbury, you say yeah. you've got to Amberley. Do you also go to Oxford? Where, or do you, does Oxford... In terms of collecting food collecting or the food. reach? Or so we, at the moment... Delivering we, and collecting. What so we don't deliver food, but we do, uh, we do work with the Oxford Community Trust. Right. And we're doing some work with the Oxford Lions. They've recently planted, um, through the Food Secure North mm -hmm. Canterbury funding that we received, they planted an enormous amount of potatoes and corn that we've done our first harvest today. So mm -hmm. we've got new potatoes that are going out to all those organisations that we support over the next, um, really the coming months until the, the stock's been exhausted. Right. So really Oxford really is self-supporting self itself basically, is it or not? Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I believe the food that we give to Oxford is valuable. They come and collect from us. It's, it's a fair distance to come and get food. So we're, we're obviously um, providing them with much needed um, additions to, to the food that they're already securing. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, so we move on rapidly to item six, and Michelle and Matt can stay there. Um, we'll take us through the process of where we're going with this hub. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, the purpose of this report is to seek support from the committee for the inclusion of $435,000 in funding in the long term plan for the development of the Kaipoi Community Hub. This report essentially draws together all the work staff have been doing over the last year with the community groups and the previous information presented to the committee in August and October. And for this reason, I'll take the report as read. Um, this afternoon, we've heard from Food Secure North Canterbury, the Kaipoi Men's Shed and the Kaipoi Croquet Club. All have indicated their support for the community hub and their willingness to be part of this. All these groups, in their own way, support the health and well-being of our community. And I'd like to say thank you to them for coming and presenting and for the work and the effort they've put in um, working with us over the last few months. Um, in particular, at the last meeting, we were asked to undertake some early consultation with the neighbouring residents near the community hub. And at the end of November, we delivered a consultation flyer to these properties in the media area and posted the same flyer to absentee owners. Um, the flyer introduced the hub project and asked for initial feedback. Um, it also let residents know that Rachel and I would be available at the community, uh, sorry, the Christmas Carnival in Kaipoi. Uh, to date, we've received two pieces of formal feedback, one in support of the hub and one in opposition. The feedback in opposition would prefer to see the land area redeveloped for residential land uses to assist with the um, housing shortage and provide some additional rates for council. And the feedback and support commented that every community needs a space to connect and this builds on resilience and wellbeing. At the carnival, Rachel and I spoke to about 10 groups of residents throughout the day. Most wanted to understand more about the project. Um, we had one resident from Wyber Place who was opposed uh, to the proposed hub. Unfortunately, they had moved in after the red zoning process and were advised at the time of purchase that there would be never any building on any land in the area. And they really enjoyed their park outlook. Um, unfortunately, there was no mitigating factors um, that would alleviate this opposition. However, the majority of the comments received were seeking more information and were in, um, I won't, they weren't joyous rapture of support, but there was an underlying, um, there was an underlying um, feeling of support. In general, the three issues raised, and these are not unknown, traffic and parking, so additional traffic coming to Courtney Drive and where were the vehicles going to park, security, um, that there was antisocial behaviour occurring in the area at the moment and that either the hub would exacerbate this or be a victim of that antisocial um, 
activity and concerns and wanting to understand what the buildings might look like, um, which is understandable from residential um, neighbours in that area. Um, all of, uh, we think that all of the above can be addressed through the development of a, a draft master plan and user obligations and these we would intend to take um, out for consultation in the new year so those residents could understand a little bit more about what we're looking at and what we're thinking about and have some of their input to that. We still have a few more days for feedback to come in um, and we'll provide an update on that in the new year. Um, as stated, the report the purpose of the report is to seek support for funding. Um, it's noted that the 435,000 for the hub is included in the current annual plan, 50,000 for this year and 435 indicated for next year. Uh, it's also been included in the draft long-term plan for consideration by council next year. Um, as noted in the report, um, the inclusion of this funding in the long-term plan is expected to have a $1.53 and 0.05% rating impact per property. Uh, as the report states, we will keep working with the hub groups that we've seen today and bring the draft master plan, user obligations and the funding strategy that Rachel's developed through for approval in the new year. Should funding become available through the long-term plan, we can then move into the detailed design, full consultation and consenting phases of the project. And Rachel and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Firstly, I just want to um, commend uh, Michelle uh, uh, in the first instance because I know you've been working on this for quite some time uh, and I commend you on um, the development of this. It really is a community developed model. It's providing a need, I think, that our, well, that's been well demonstrated uh, and I, I don't have any uh, issue at all in this being considered in the long term plan and the organisations that have spoken all have talked of the various needs that they have. It's kind of similar to the model we developed some years ago at Northbrook Studios and see how that's been a really good success. Uh, the Croquet, there's been a lot of work going with our Croquet Club um, over the years and considering even options on their own site to mitigate the effects of flooding and other impacts and it's just, there just isn't really an answer apart from moving from another or building a giant bund, um, which is, isn't really terribly practical. So I know that they have looked at all options and really the only option really is to look at moving. And at 115 years of age, I think they deserve um, the opportunity for a new site. So I'm in full support of that. Uh, it's also an opportunity for that club to, to um, build its membership. And we look at what Rangura Croquet has done through its new site, New Greens, it now has a very strong membership. And I understand Kaiapoi's membership is growing, so um, I fully support that. Um, around um, Satisfied Food Rescue, um, I think they've built their case very well and they've indicated um, the growth that they have there. I've, I've had the opportunity to visit all the um, various groups actually, including the Men's Shed. I went down before the election last year and had a good look at what they were doing. Um, Rangura invited me recently down to their site. They were measured me up for a coffin, actually. <laughs> uh, I need to say that it was a very large one they required, but um, I was quite... Um, quite <laughs> surprised how industrious they are as, as is our, our Kaipoi men's shed and, and the, all the tasks that they're involved with that they build um, and make including the daffodils that go on the bridge in Kaipoi there's a really co real community aspect behind all these organisations so from my point of view it's a no-brainer that this should be considered as part of our long-term plan uh, we've got to be careful what we say in this process because uh, obviously we're subject to a process but I, I personally think that the inclusion of this uh, um, is something that our council um, should consider strongly as it comes into its long-term plan next year. It's an excellent use of the land uh, and, and also the hubbing for those organisations. They, as you can hear today from the comments that have been made, those organisations look to be very aligned and I don't think there'll be any issue there and I think Michelle you've done your due diligence. Michelle is, um, sorry, Rachel as well is helping out with the funding and other aspects which will go on behind it. So the council including 435 thousand is just the start really the other organizations will need to get in behind and fundraise um, for the additional activity but from my point of view it's an ideal um, location 
and a community hub will help develop our community further, so it carries my support. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, without preempting the LTP process, um, I'm seconding this, I obviously support it going through to, to that stage, and the Mayor's used the, the term no-brainer, and I also, uh, but it's a no-brainer as far as uh, everything's concerned. Um, the presentations were absolutely brilliant. I love the way the word well-being was being brought in by some of the uh, some of the groups. This is a, today's agenda is incredibly big. It is incredibly important as far as positioning ourselves, not only for the near future, but the long-term future, which is why well, I was a bit grumpy to see such a large agenda, to be honest. But um, getting back on track, um, well done. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I see this as enhancing community wellbeing and um, I came to the realisation that all the groups that have presented have uh, common goals, really. Social connection, fellowship, companionship, dealing with social isolation. Um, so I, I, I think it's great and if we can all work together or the groups can work together, I think there can be great outcomes. So I'm in support of the recommendation. Yeah, 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 whatever. Um, so I'll put um, A to F for um, adoption. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank them all and invite yeah. them to yeah. stay for the rest yeah. of the meeting. Yeah. Thank, you every, thank you, everybody. You're all welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if that is your <laughs> wish for the, a warm, hot afternoon. Otherwise, you are welcome to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for hearing from us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your help. I'll try not to forget right of reply again. Excuse me. Can I just make a wee note so we can change it? It's actually A to K. What did I say? A to F. Did I? I think you mean I <laughs> Oh yes, 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 gotcha. That's what so we just, just yeah, no, but we just need to change the yeah. <coughs> Right, we're up to where are we? Six point two. Sam. Our youth development report. Sam and helper. <laughs> little elf, you brought your little elf along. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, my name is Sam Redman, Youth Development Facilitator. Um, and uh, here is uh, Nathan Croft. He's one of our youth development interns um, who has been helping us out with. Um, with a project that you'll hear about uh, very soon. Um, uh, Nathan is a master's student from the University of Canterbury and came to us through the PACE program at uh, UC. Um, so, don't want to take up a huge amount of time here, so I will take the two reports as read, but um, by way of a quick summary, over the last year and a half through the PACE program, we've had two master's student interns join us in the community team for a few months at a time. Those internships focused on, oh, and sorry, I will, oh yeah, thanks dear. <laughs> um, at the internships focused on two related areas, youth spaces and youth activities, um, and resulted in the two reports that you will have seen. Those two specific issues were identified because despite uh, the important and ongoing work done by youth action groups over the last 10 years, youth spaces and events are still consistently identified as areas of challenge for our district. 
Nathan was our first intern. He joined us in late 2019, and he produced the Youth Spaces Report. Um, and he is just going to briefly tell you a little bit about um, the two reports. Thanks, Nathan. So the internships involved uh, extensive consultation with young people and community stakeholders, as well as research into existing local, regional, national, international, um, and international ideas and solutions. I spent a number of weeks meeting and talking with stakeholders from the Youth Services Network to identify areas of need within the community. Um, areas of need from, from the community's perspective. I also researched a number of different youth space models from around the country and overseas. Suban, the other intern, developed and distributed a survey which received 196 submissions from young people across the district in relation to youth activities. Both reports, while having different focuses, identified some similar areas of need and opportunity, including transportation being a barrier for many young people, difficulty gaining employment due to lack of experience and skills, um, and the need for access to services regarding mental health and well-being. The two reports also offer some recommendations for next steps, which include the development of a youth centre or centres, establishment of a network of youth-friendly spaces incorporating the libraries and skate parks, provision of transportation for young people, programmes that develop young people's skills, talents and experience, and initiatives that give young people a place to belong, get connected and get access to the services they need. Another key outcome which should be mentioned is the work done in gathering information for an online direct directory of youth services, opportunities and places which I put together as part of my, as part of my internship. Cool. Thanks Nathan. Um, so moving swiftly on, um, so what are our next steps? I've just got a few that I'll quickly run through. Uh, the first of these, following on from the reports, is to present the reports to the Youth Services Network, um, which will be as part of a youth forum. Um, we really think it's vital that our community be provided with good information to make informed decisions about their work, um, and we don't want that work to be lost. So uh, this will be a priority in 2021. Following on from what Nathan said, the development of an online directory. Uh, this is an exciting piece of work, which we're really keen to progress. We want this to be a useful tool for both youth organisations and for young people themselves to find information about what's going on for young people in the district in terms of events, opportunities, uh, places to hang out. Uh, it does need to be some careful consideration uh, around the we best way to implement this, whether it's um, a phone app, a website or some other form. I mentioned this already, but a youth forum will be another... Uh, objective. Uh, the Youth Forum will present the reports, the survey results, the research undertaken over the last year and a half, and it will ask stakeholders to consider what objectives should be included as part of a youth-friendly community plan. Which is uh, the final point here, the creation of a youth-friendly community plan. Uh, drawing on everything that's gone before, bringing it all together into some tangible objectives with some concrete goals. Um, and then working with the network and the broader community to implement them, to, so to see some action taken. Um, and there's potential that there may be another youth internship which will work with the university as part of that, uh, that whole piece of work. Um, could we move on to the next slide? And the one next, sorry. Uh, so I just want to take uh, this opportunity to present a concept which has been floating around in my head for about a year, which I think has some potential as we look forward, especially as we look at writing the Youth Friendly Communities Plan. As we've been uh, consulting with the community and as we've had discussions with stakeholders, as needs and issues have been identified, this is a concept that has been uh, work working, I guess, bubbling away in my mind. Um, so I'll just quickly run through it, keeping in mind that it is uh, relatively high level, it doesn't delve into details, it hasn't yet been presented to the youth network, but a model like this or similar to this could provide a good framework to address many of the identified needs that we're seeing in our district. So really quickly, uh, satellite centres. So potentially a centre in each town, whatever that looks like. It may not look like a traditional youth centre that you're picturing in your mind. Maybe it's an existing space. Maybe um, it's a coffee shop that has uh, a youth night um, or, or a community centre that's already existing. Um, like I said, use of existing locations. Uh, a notice board, whether that's physical or online, advertising upcoming activity across the district. 
uh, and youth-friendly spaces. So the satellite centers are obviously represented by the, the four bubbles there. Uh, the youth-friendly spaces are represented by the white bubbles, which could be a network of official youth-friendly spaces across the district endorsed by Waimakariri Youth Spaces. And these could be skate parks, coffee shops, uh, parks, etc., with endorsed spaces regularly being used and promoted as part of whatever the program is. Next slide, please. Uh, so a strong network, which is obviously uh, shown by the lines there, uh, with a shared program of events, initiatives, workshops, and training. Uh, transportation, this is a key one. It's come up time and time again um, with, within our consultations. Um, with, so having, having the transportation to connect our young people. And a consistent brand, Waimakariri Youth Spaces or an alternative, which creates a recognizable identity. And I think this last point there really sums up a lot of what we're saying here. Um, something that will connect young people of the district through a network of spaces, places, and events. Just to put some of that into perspective, um, a couple of fictional scenarios to consider. Jonathan is 14, lives in Oxford with his parents and siblings. It's Friday night, he doesn't have much to do, so he and a couple of friends jump into a specially organized youth van, which takes them into Kaipoi, where a youth movie night is taking place at the community center. They have a great time hanging out, having fun, and the community youth workers are super cool. Potential, that's a potential uh, scenario that we could see happening. Uh, Lydia is 17. She also attends the movie night on a Friday, and she notices there's a coffee van run entirely by young people. She's been looking for a job, but she's been told time and time again she doesn't have the required experience. She signs up to help, and by this time next month, she's serving coffee and hot chocolates, gaining valuable experience, and she also starts getting involved with community events, which the coffee van attends. Grace is 13 and has been struggling recently with anxiety and depression. She went to see the school counselors, but they're super busy right now. She's not sure what to do. The school youth workers let her know about an event happening down at the youth center this week, and she decides it could be fun. While there, she notices that the youth center also has counselors, and she puts her name down for a free appointment. Sammy is a 15-year-old high school student who finishes school at 3.20 p.m. and heads down High Street to hang out with her friends. They go to a local youth-friendly coffee shop where, in the hour after school, they can get $2 coffees and hot chocolates. They hang out for a couple of hours in a safe, youth-friendly space. So I think we can all agree that it would be fantastic to see stories like this becoming more commonplace in our district. Issues of social isolation, employment, well-being, belonging, community connection are issues which we see coming up regularly. I do want to stress that there is good work already being done, done in these areas, but there are still gaps, barriers, and opportunities. This could be a way of addressing some needs and issues, or perhaps there's another way, but the hope is that out of the youth-friendly communities plan, we will see some action taking place and some positive outcomes like this, whatever form they might take. Final thoughts. Um, Again, don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, this is something that I try and remind myself about often. When we talk about youth development, the young people of our district are the main thing. As our youth strategy says, we want to see young people engaged and connected, valued and supported, and given the opportunity to grow, develop, and get excited about their future. Our job now, in collaboration with the community, is to translate the work that we've done into tangible actions that will make a difference for our young people. I'm really looking forward to that challenge, and I think our community is up for it too. So thank you for your time, and if there are any questions, we would be happy to take them. Just a question from me. Um, having spoken to a mother yesterday, um, that she has a daughter that's um, visually impaired mm. and, and, and has actually become really um, yes, and, and and is not coping, and she's just really struggling about how she can get her daughter out into the into this youth spaces and to try and develop her more. So yeah, question, I mean, please. That, <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's a hard one, and I think um, with the added difficulty of being visually impaired, that that does add to it. But we and I've seen a, a lot of young people. I think social isolation 
often we don't think about young people, but there are uh, young people out there who um, are not connected. Um, part of that is social media, th part of that is um, just not having the confidence to step out. And I think, you know, there are, there are uh, programs out there that are, hap that are happening in our community, some really great vibrant youth groups and um, other community activities. Um, and it, but I think one of the big issues, and I think this is where the directory that we've been talking about comes into play, is actually getting that information out into people's hands, um, making sure young people know what is, what is on offer. Um, but yeah, there are gaps and there, there, there are opportunities, I think, for, the fu for future development. And that's where I think perhaps there is a gap at the moment that mm. needs to probably be fulfilled. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Please. I think B doesn't really quite read correctly, so I wondered where the tense is out. Notes staff presented um, to the Community and Recreation Committee, the rest as is, and um, request staff to present the findings and reports to the Youth Council and Y Youth Committees, and the rest as is. Absolutely. Any other, any uh, just briefly, excellent report, um, Sam, really enjoyed the findings. Thank you to the interns, for, to both of you, for the work that you have have collected here. I think you're right, Sam, um, the propositions you stated at the end were probably really ideal solutions, so if we can get to that point, that will be excellent. I just I wanted to make sure that it gets to Y Youth and to the Youth Council, because obviously they are our key... Uh, mm. constituents in this case and also our key partners in, in constructs of our own organisation so I know you will, would have anyway but I just think it's important that our yeah. council suggests that that go uh, is the pr place in which that goes. Uh, I just like uh, seeing the year to commend you for all your efforts Sam. I, I know Nikki, uh, Kirsten and myself are on the Youth Council. We know how much work you put in and how respected you are by our young people um, for the way in which you um, take them on that journey. So just to say thank you and happy Christmas. Thank yeah, you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sam, and thank you very much for all the work you've done. Um, I'm just looking at when I first came on to council, I was on the youth, yeah. and and seeing the difference, you know, how, how you've involved and grown and, and uh, taken the children along with you, which is wonderful. And I really... And this is just the beginning of adding more to it, and I've given you perhaps something to think about as well. And I really appreciate your, the work you, you're all doing. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. My two cents worth in here. Great report, Sam. And um, I love the um, the concrete, cool ideas that you've gathered from all over the place and put into this report. And I am looking forward to seeing how our Youth Council receives them and um, seeing what we can hopefully put into action Absolutely. in the next year. So hats off to you both. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, without any further ado, let's put 6.2 for adoption, A2D. All, um, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Moving on, 6.3. Thank Thanks, guys. Cheers. Tessa. Age-friendly report. Yep. Yeah. 6.9. For, for, for Pegasus. Yeah, I was thinking of that. We'll go next. Good afternoon, and um, I'd like to welcome Joanne Gumbrell, who is the chair of the Age Friendly Advisory Group, who has come to um, to join us and to support Madeline uh, with the great work that she's done in preparing the progress report. So, um, this report um, details key activity 
in relation to the delivery of the age-friendly Waimakariri plan um, over the past six months. And the intention is that we uh, come back to the Community and Recreation Committee um, every six months, just with an update as to how the plan is progressing. Um, this, this report focuses on four key areas um, that are detailed in the progress report, those being community support and health services, available to older people in the district, uh, respect and social inclusion, communication and information and social participation that is making sure that older people are able to participate in the life of the community, have their voice heard and be involved. Um, <clears throat> some of this work sits under business as usual. And uh, when the plan was developed, um, it was highlighted that the plan was intended to be something of a gap analysis and an opportunity analysis to um, ensure that the great stuff that's already happening in our community to make sure that older people are included, empowered, informed, um, continued, but that um, it could be built on. So. Um, this report particularly summarises key activities that are either new, are complete, have been completed over the past six months, or are still outstanding. And in terms of outstanding activities, it is likely that they will be delivered on in the next period or two. Um, you will see the full progress report and an overview of the age-friendly model attached to uh, my report. And I ask that the committee notes the work of the age-friendly facilitator, Madeline Burden, and the age-friendly advisory group in really championing the cause of quality lives for our older people in the district, and particularly the role that they played over the COVID-19 event in making sure that older people had access to information and support that they needed. Um, we, I will take the report as read, and Madeline is happy to answer any questions that you might have. We know it all. Because you've, you've, you're older. <laughs> that, as, as in, uh, you have explained it all very competently, Tessa. <laughs> no questions? T Nikki. As always, I love your work, ladies. Um, I noticed on page 98, one of the priorities, you talked about continued promotion and facilitation of mature driver refresher training, which is outstanding, but is back on track. Um, I'd love more information about that. Okay, so the Age Concern actually provide that in our district. Um, they've had some staff uh, leave before and after COVID. There's three new staff who've actually connected us with us. And I asked, um, I think it's Liz Gray recently, so she said they'll be kicking back in early next year. So. And Sorry, and how do you, how do you um, connect with that? So the... the Programs are developed and advertised, so people need to enrol, and they engage other local services in our area. So we'll put it in chatter, but I can add you into an email cool. about that. If um, uh, that would be great, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously not asking for myself, but um, but, but my mother has my my mother arrived here well about 14 years ago, and she got her license and passed her test and got all of that. But she's never really been confident enough to drive here, uh -huh. and I think that something like that would be just what the doctor ordered. So, so sorry, I was asking purely out of personal interest, but um, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Wendy, we only got to move A to receive the report. Uh, sorry? No, they're all notes. Oh, well, I, we, we, we still receive them. Okay, A to D, receive in three notes. Um, Wendy. Thank you very much for the hard work that's been done. 
you've got the big new computer work and mm -hmm. so the COVID-19 has changed things mm -hmm. around. Making us more aware of just what is required in our community, and it's still bubbling up too. So, mm. I just like to say thank you very much, and we have got another year of um, real serious mm. thinking about. Mm. And while I'm just about this, I'd just like to mention Yvonne Palmer, uh -huh. that was our um, coordinator for the. Um, the driver training. Um, Yvonne became extremely ill last year and she's had to give it away now. So hopefully, um, I, I think there's another one starting very shortly, but, and, and that was all done through road safety. So thank you. Simply that, um, as always, this, I receive your report with admiration and gratitude. <laughs> well done, ladies. and. Um, Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. It's a privilege to do the work. No, any other speakers? Everyone happy? Wendy, right of reply? Thank you. I'll put 6.3 for adoption then. Stop grinning at me, Mr Mayor. Um, <laughs> all those in favour say aye. aye. Against carried. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very jovial meeting, I have to say. There's a lot of laughter. <laughs> it's kind of unsettling. Um, <laughs> we could do laughing. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. So the purpose of my report is to um, share and discuss any of the potential solutions that were identified to address the space issues at Rangiora Library, address the end of life status of the district library self-issue kiosk, and socialise the recommendation to abolish fining our youngest people in the district for having overdue library box and library items, I should say. I'll take it as the report is largely read. Um, as this is my first time reporting in this sort of LTP, um, please correct me if I'm doing anything wrong, but I would like to um, share a little bit of local information pertaining to the four points that we've addressed, that we've noted um, in the report. So 4.2 um, addresses the need for the library self-issue kiosks to be replaced or improved. Um, I'd like to just to share with you some thinking that went on behind this report. So there is significant technological changes happening in the library self-issue kiosk environment. In the next five to seven years, um, zero to five years, we can realistically anticipate that the self-issue machine as we know it will not change significantly. In the five to ten year landscape, it is probable that people in our community, predominantly younger people, will be using an app on their cell phones that they can issue their own books. And I wanted to socialise that that's been, that, that is being explored and we are current with that thinking. But given our local con our use of the consortia APNK for our library services, they are not in the space to take on board the app service that is available in some libraries overseas. So that, that has been considered. I'd also like to share that investigation has happened into a basic upgrade of the software inside of the kiosks. We are v running on a version 4, which is a bit like an iPhone three or four generations ago. And as we know with Apple and major phone providers, they, this, the ability to replace the components becomes more and more difficult. This afternoon in preparation for the meeting, I did contact the vendor and say, in, anticipation of a, of a quirky question around the technology. If worse come to worse, could we survive with an internal upgrade of those machines? He said for now it is possible and I'm wanting to disclose that publicly, but the investment would be a short-term solution to a, a, what is essentially a, a long-term challenge for us as a district library service. I anticipate that uh, by upgrading the kiosks, it would take us uh, from 
next year to probably six, seven years from now, when the app-based technology would be more dominant and we would be re-evaluating the library self-service options um, again. So that's just some of the background thinking that went, that was not recorded in that report, otherwise it would have been a novel. And in thinking about uh, points 4.4, .4, and 4.5, which really address the space issues at Rangiora Library. I'd like to pub state publicly that I acknowledge and appreciate the reasons for the deferral of the Rangiora Library extension. Um, we accept that the library as it is at the moment has actually outgrown its space as of 2014. Um, district population growth and use of the library is very different to what it was 10 years ago, as uh, Richard talked about um, in his presentation. It's widely acknowledged that libraries are more about books than, um, than, than, they, than they were. And now that we have the NZLPP, the New Zealand Libraries Partnership, two positions, um, we are about a lot more about learning as well. I'd like to just share some good news that we received this morning. We have been proud recipients of a third full-time secondment to the NZLPP that will take will start recruiting in January for that. So that's three full-time positions until the end of June 2022. Um, I get, got what I asked one of my team to grab some data on active library users at the moment. So within the district, we have approximately 35,000 members. The last full non-COVID year, uh, so we're looking at July 2018 to end of June 2019, we had just on 14,000 active library users. In the last six months, we have had just on 11,000 active library users. As we're offering more services beyond the book, we're not taking away from the book, it's the end and end, our use, the use of our services and our spaces is at a premium. Last Thursday night, we hosted a book launch at Rurutani Whakaiapui Civic Centre. We had five assist dogs, nearly 50 members from the community, and we had an amazing night launching a locally produced book about assist dogs. I'd like to just read you what one of my team was shared about the use of the library space um, by two ladies who have been library users for a very long time. Years ago they told us that libraries would be gone from our communities as they would be outdated and no longer needed now that we have everything online. But look what is happening here this evening. Who would have thought that we could have dogs and so much joy in our library? She went on to say how she loves the atmosphere in our libraries, how she can feel she can just pop in in, in a time when she simply needs a space to be in without any pressure to buy anything. She also said how amazing the staff are, so friendly and helpful. Last night we hosted the Rangiora Volunteers Christmas event and at the end of the night we were reassembling the library and I've known for a long time that the shelving at Rangiora is not fit for purpose but it took five staff to move a double bay of books and to be perfectly honest some of our staff would not physically be able to do that and libraries at Kaiapoi I can move a double bay of books on my own. That's how heavy and restrictive the, the things are at the shelving is at, at Rangiora. So I'm just putting that into context. Um, are there any questions about those bits? I'll move on to fine, sorry. I was just going to ask you, Paula, did you have any priorities in Clause 5.1? Um, we're talking about the library kiosk replacement. Um, is that the software upgrade only, or do you get new Sorry, and, and which one, sorry, which point? 5.1. Uh, oh, sorry, oh, at the back. Yeah. The kiosk... Yep. They get an upgrade of the software. Is the whole kiosk replaced? Uh, 
so the library kiosk replacement is the full thing. So the, the, the old, the old um, hardware frame, internals, everything is gone. It's replaced so the screen becomes five inches bigger and the screen's also a lot more responsive to the, the touch um, technology as opposed to what, what it was four years ago, um, six years ago when it came in. And we're getting a lot of older people finding it quite difficult to work those screens. Um, that's some of the feedback. So, so yes, um, that would be a full wholesale replacement of each thing. In terms of priority, um, is that more important than shelving, or you'd like everything you've itemised, obviously? If we talk about priorities, uh, what runs the ship and what adds on to the ship. So the kiosks are an integral part of library service now. It's, it's a bit like saying we'll, we'll go back to not using calculators or, or, or not having um, computers, um, ev you know, evolution of services and, and service models. So if I'm really honest, uh, kiosks are just a standard um, library item that should be on a renewal cycle. By doing a full-scale replacement now, it future-proofs us for the next six years. We could do an internal um, software upgrade in six years, or we could be looking at um, not having as many kiosks and using the handheld technology as it evolves. I can't future gaze. No library in New Zealand is doing the app service at the moment, but I am over the developments overseas and I'm confident in that sort of five to ten year, seven to ten year window, that's where we'll be. As population grows, we will need more kiosks. So I would uh, I would like to say that in that sort of five to ten year window, we would not be buying more kiosks, but we would be enabling the handheld devices that most of us carry to do some of that work in conjunction with great customer service to enable people to feel confident. Um, I would say my most important uh, thing in here is fines free. The fact that we have close to a thousand children under 18 unable to use their library card or any electronic resources in a district like ours is. Um, that, I'll just leave that there. Um, we are one of the few library services in New Zealand that find our young people. Um, we are most library service, many library services are investigating fine free for all people because they realise that those who need libraries the most cannot afford any debt. To many of us with our privilege, $4 might not be a barrier, but for, for a lot of people it is. And when I was talking to one of my staff, um, I asked for her, you know, for her thoughts on overdue fines, and she would just had a mum come in, and this story, um, to me, would definitely make fine free our priority. We're going to be able to make um, additional shelving needs met with some of the NZLPP funding. So one third of that council approved last year some shelving, um, additional shelving, so that's phase one. NZLPP is bringing to life phase two. Um, economies of scale means we'll get more if we do it all at once, but the fine free for me um, is, is the most important. The mother who came in said that she'd joined the library a few years earlier when her two oldest children were very young. At the time she was a single mum Life was very difficult and chaotic. She loved coming to the library with her babies and reading them stories, but they had lost some books. They had to move frequently, and she didn't have the confidence or the words to come in and talk to library staff, and the overdue fines grew. The easiest thing for her was to stop coming to the library and avoid the situation and the debt. Fast forward five years, this young woman had, come, had remarried and there was a new baby and the family had a steady income stream and a permanent home. But they still couldn't visit the library because they owed money. It was difficult and embarrassing. And embarrassing is the thing that we hear most. I was on a national hui last week representing public libraries of New Zealand and the non-judgmental space that libraries offer was recognised by Internet New Zealand and the 43 other participants at the hui. The family would love to be able to access more books for their children and their children are coming home from school talking about the library and being told they need a library cart. But now what do they do? Finally, this woman came into the library. She approached Jenny Kirkwood at the desk and explained that she wanted to join the library but there's a problem. 
She started to chat with Jenny and before long Jenny had met the whole family, sorted out the money issues and everyone had a new library card and could access the new books and online resources. Jenny coached her to talk about problems in the future with her library card so this situation does not come up again. Jenny said that children love books and as a librarian I never want to be the person who comes between a child and a book. She said that children should not be singled out from the rest of their classmates when they cannot have a library card. So that was that was very, very powerful to receive. So that's my priority. <laughs> right. I'll take any questions. <laughs> no questions. Thank you. Are you questioning or moving? Well, I was questioning. Right I was going to question that I want to move. Okay. okay. Um, these smart shelves, is RFID, they they look pretty special. So they 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 are they are special, but they are becoming business as usual. So I should have brought you a list of all the libraries across New Public Libraries that are doing this, and we're not just talking the Auckland and Christchurch. No, we're no. talking small. They are the most space efficient, time efficient mm. way of processing library books. Nothing's perfect. We're not going to get a hundred percent return on them, mm. like perfect. No. But we don't get that with people either. No. That's, they look really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So Wendy's with that, I'll, I'll, I'll second from the chair. Yeah, Wendy. Just, yeah hang on a minute. <laughs> I've got to get back to where I'm supposed to be. Right, I'll move from A to E and um, just recommendation. And I would just like to say thank you very much, Paula, once again. A very interesting um, me, um report you've, you've got done for us and you're doing a marvellous job and really appreciate everything you and your staff do. It's, it's really commendable. Thank, Thank you. you. Very briefly uh, support the report, uh, also um, support consideration of your request in the long term plan. I think it's important that we keep place in our, in our libraries, noting the issues you raised around the weight of um, shelving as well. I just uh, went to your to the library volunteers function last night and I just echo your comments, there's such a great spirit there uh, and it's been a difficult year and your team have certainly really stepped up, certainly through the um, COVID period with the issuing of books etc, I think um, really excelled yourselves there so look, um, we'll look at your con your um, requests uh, in, in terms you. of the LTP. I I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the case you put of the family and barriers, there shouldn't be barriers to learning and people accessing in our community. It's really important. I know you're doing work with Karanga Mai as well. Went to their prize giving last week and they came up and spoke to me specifically about the work that you're doing and they appreciate um, trying to remove those barriers for those um, uh, young parents uh, being able to access book, books and learning in our community. So look, thank you for all that you do. Really appreciate it, Paula. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wondered um, the fine free uh, proposal in clause 5.1.5, does that have to be part of the LTP or can that be addressed sooner than that? Should be part of the LTP. All of these matters will be subject to further LTP consideration later in January. Right. Does the librarian have a discretion over imposing fines? I'm really the wrong person to ask. Right. <laughs> I'll withdraw that question. <laughs> but just to say thank, thank you. you. I'll put and happy Paul Christmas to all of you. Six point four. All those in favour say aye. aye. Yes, carried. Thank you, Paula. Many thanks. Thanks for all your support. Um, with the committee's um, approval, I'm going to change the order slightly and bring 6.9 up next so the Pegasus ladies can get to go home before midnight. So, um, Matt, can you... Um, uh, not Matt, Grant. <laughs> so we're going to 6.9. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
also just to the committee, thank you as well for the uh, reports that we've put up today. Obviously there's quite a lot of reading there. Um, but this is, I guess, the end of a lot of work that we've been doing, um, especially around kind of looking at some of the community facility and sports facility stuff that we've got going on within community and recreation. So really important that we have um, some decisions on these and also give you a bit of a briefing before uh, the LTP next January. Um, also just want to point out to um, Shona and the Wooding Sefton Community Board and also to the Pegasus Residence Group, the Triple R's. Um, obviously they've been quite tenacious and actually, I, I believe that's a polite phrase, um, and actually kind of getting us to, to where we've got to with um, certainly half of this report in regards to Pegasus. So as with my predecessors, I'll take the report as read. Um, I realise that there's quite a few things in there in terms of what you'll be wanting to um, get into and around asking questions. A couple of the things that are really important. Um, the Pegasus Residence Group have um, just asked that I point out that the land in question, obviously as Richard had said, um, was actually 70 Motu Key in terms of one of the preferences that uh, both the group and also Richard had recommended within the report. Um, that's the area of land um, that's basically at the end of the bridge and on the uh, lake frontage. Um, Richard felt that that was actually a really important piece of land from a Pegasus perspective because it could be opened up onto the lake should we be in a position where the lake is um, as clean as one of Matt's pools um, and that people are actually able to use it and, and interact with it. Um, it's also worth pointing out as well, it's probably not the entire parcel of land. So whilst we've got $1.8 million in there, it's really an up to figure. Um, the reality is that without land negotiations at this point in time, we're trying to cover how much we believe we might need in order to go through that process. We're anticipating it'll probably take around about a year to go through the land purchase. Um, and that's purely because of the fact that there's some um, uh, anomalies there with the fact that it's one big title at this point in time. We're trying to tie the, as you'll see in one of the recommendations there, we're trying to tie the youth project into it, which is, <coughs> excuse me, um, is currently earmarked as a skate park. Um, noting that the board are quite keen for it to potentially be something else. Um, I just have to, to uh, say that. Um, so look, there's there's the potential to kind of bring that into into play as well. In terms of Ravenswood, uh, at this point in time, we're really trying to indicate that from the report that Richard's put up, we believe that there's going to be a need there in the future. Um, now he's put a few options within the draft report, and as we say, it is a draft report, so there's a bit of discussion that we need to have with him. Um, but this is really to give a pre-indication before the council meeting in um, late January around the LTP as to some of the thinking that we've had and that he's had in there as well. Um, we obviously have a few of the level of service triggers uh, coming into play, especially around the likes of community facility um, in Ravenswood and then also in terms of library services within Ravenswood as well. Um, we have options, I guess, within the area and we're not going to know as much today is what we will in the future. So really the idea is to try and identify some budgets so that we might be able to um, purchase land at a point in time when the community's grown a bit more and we understand more of what it is that we might be looking at. At this point in time with Ravenswood it's really an unknown. Um, we're trying to preempt the fact that we know that we're probably going to need some form of service there in the future. That's why that budget's been put uh, in there to um, explore the purchase of land there. Um, noting that Richard had also suggested that there might be opportunities to either utilise some space at the Woodend Community Centre um, or uh, for a library type service or actually look at uh, Woodend Recreation Reserve itself or even Gladstone Park. None of those have been explored at this point in time um, but that's why staff have gone with the recommendation of actually purchasing land within Ravenswood um, because we believe that that would service where the key activity centre is and where the community is as well. Um, so that's why that's in there. Um, a lot of talking points there, so I'm, I'm mindful of not just me reading the report out, but I'll open the floor up for questions. <laughs> Can you just explain the process of this report? Because it says considers. What does considers mean? And also I note that in my report it's got the same, it's got A, B and E are the same point, they're actually doubled. It's asking for 
Minions yeah, so, twice. <laughs> so, so sorry, one's, one's for Pegasus, one's for Ravenswood. Oh, one's for Pegasus, one's for Ravenswood. Okay, yep. cool. Sorry, just trying to figure that one out. Yeah, and so, sorry, the reason that we've used the word considers is because this committee um, is basically stating to council that it considers the inclusion of these budgets within the LTP. So what I'm asking is, when you say considers now, without the whole council being part of this budget process, um, it will go to our budget meetings in January, yep. and at that point we get the chance to decide whether it's in or out and the yes. financial ramifications. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Just this this to is really an endorsement. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you for the report, Grant, and, and I think um, through Kirsten's questioning is exactly right that this is just a recommendation through to the LTP for Council's consideration, and ultimately um, whether Council considers it or not will be considered in the wider context, but I, I personally feel that at the very least we should be considering land purchase in both uh, or setting aside land or having the opportunity for land in both Pegasus and Ravenswood to future-proof opportunities for the council. I'm not going to express a view about buildings at this particular point in time, nor libraries, because they're things that we do need to consider in the wider context. But it's important when we're considering the 10-year plan that these items do go forward and are considered and that the timings, dates, etc., we will need to debate further. Um, as part of that, but as a holding position, I think this makes a lot of sense. I'm not going to be able to be here for, so I'm going to go and present some awards, um, but I'm not going to be able to hear for the Sefton one, but I similarly support that report, because uh, that community has uh, worked hard, it's fundraised, it's got to a point now where it's identified a, a facility, and I think it's timely that w we as a council do consider a contribution towards that, and there's a range of conditions around that, but I think if we, you know, we'd be remiss not to be considering parcels of land at the very least for future provisioning, um, because the, it's been identified that we do need to make sure that we have facilities of some sort there in the future, so securing parcels of land at the very least is where I'll be um, I'm not signalling where my support would lie coming into the LTP. Yes, I, I will actually just go back to the recommendation and, and make sure that it is, it, it is up to 1.8 million. Um, and really, I'm I'm uh, really supportive of both areas being uh, put into this um, recommendation because they will they will be all both of them will be developing quite substantially. And um, it'll do me thinking. <laughs> Just speaking to um, the report, I don't have a vote on this committee, but I would still, uh, if I had, I would have put it forward, because I do think that's a very important area that we need to discuss. I'm just very, very cautious about over-promising and under-delivering. We're going to have a very, very tight uh, budget in the next two to three years with all the effects that um, COVID and has had on our economy. So I want to reiterate that this is a consider um, it's going to be putting everything on the board and then we're going to see the financial ramifications for the rating particularly for the next three years um, Pegasus has um, been hard done by in my view I've I lived in Woodend Pegasus should have had more facilities um, considering the level of population the area of um, Woodend including North Woodend which is known as Ravenswood and Pegasus is going to be the third biggest area in our district um, it d deserves some good servicing, but the question is when. And I'm of a mind with um, Dan, where I actually agree, which the land that we need to make sure that we've got so that we can make sure for the future. But whether we're going to have the funding to be able to build this in the short term, I'm still not clear until I see the financials in January. Thank you. Um, some of the points I was going to make has been made by Councillor Barnett. Um, I'm, I'm I very much believe in land banking. With Coldstream, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now if we hadn't had the vision years ago to bank uh, some some land. Uh, 
it got some flack in the community when we purchased that large area of, of land. Quite rightly, questions were asked, and it and it went through. I'll give a heads up now that as far as uh, these items are, are concerned, I'll be arguing for them in our January meeting, bearing in mind that they will then go out for consultation. Um, no other point. I believe in land banking for the for the future. I had a wee snap at uh, Mr. Cleary about a month, six weeks ago. Some of you will call. I never look just at today. I'm always looking for tomorrow and uh, try to have a 50-year vision uh, on, on decisions such as such as these. <laughs> I'll put that then. All those in favour, say aye. Against carried. Thank you. I'll, you can go home now. <laughs> you can go to. Thanks, um, thanks, Grant. Uh, Matt. Um, yeah, you, you got six points. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, the purpose of my report is to update the Community and Recreation Committee on the planning and delivery of two key works, uh, the District Aquatic Strategy and the updated Aquatic Asset Management and Capital Replacement Scheduling ahead of long-term plan deliberations. I'll be happy to take the report as read but wish to highlight a couple of key points. Um, the District Aquatic Strategy was developed to assess our current operation and inform our long-term planning. Input was sought from key stakeholders, staff and elected officials and fed into the process along with current industry trends, local demographic projections, projections and council's growth modelling. The resulting document highlights a number of opportunities to maximise our operation with our current network and, defined, and defines the community need for further development in the form of site expansion and new site development. Where the work falls within current budgets, staff have already begun to explore and implement these works. To ensure we are able to continue to meet the community demand for services and space within the next 10 years, the strategy recommends a number of works including investigations, expansion at Kaiapoi and construction of a new facility in the North East. The recommendations for these works are based on community demand, projected growth and district demographic stats. However, considering the current economic environment, Council's other project commitments and the community's ability to afford such, a, such development, staff recommendation is to push, push the majority of these works out beyond the current long-term plan period, except for the issue of purchase of land and investigation into the development in Kaiapoi. As highlighted um, by many of the speakers earlier, um, it is important that the purchase of the land goes ahead if possible, as further delay will only result in increased cost to Council, a smaller land package or uh, the only land available being in de less desirable locations. While delaying the other recommendations from the strategy will likely see demand outstrip supply, Considerate management and operation of sites would ensure we are able to best maximise their use and if the economic outlook was to improve, there is potential for these works to be brought forward. Finally, an increase in un unplanned, unplanned maintenance issues over recent years prompted further investigation into aquatics asset management and capital renewals programme. A survey was conducted completing a full asset identification and condition assessment process to a component level across our four sites. Staff compared historic maintenance cost and useful life data with the original operation and maintenance manuals and recent contractor quotes to compile a more accurate picture of the aquatic plant systems. The recreation budget cons currently consists of 579000 for plant maintenance and capital renewals over the next 10 year period, however this work has identified the need to increase that by a further $1.66 million for an overall budget of $2.25 million over the next 10 year period just to maintain the current le levels of service. While this work does require commitment of additional budget, this work will be loan funded decreasing the rating requirement and ensuring that if future condition assessments of the equipment do not require replacement, this work can be deferred with no impact.
happy to take questions. How much have we spent on the Kaiapui heat pump? Uh, yes, so that was uh, 200 and... Uh, no, that wasn't the Kaiapui. Uh, overall, it's... Overall, it's been 220 in the last about three years spent on heat pumps and maintenance and compressors. And when I read this report, I, I, I struggle with this. This is a, a need. Um, and that's why I asked the question, how much have we spent and why, haven't, why aren't we replacing That, that that is part of this this plan is is it, yeah includes the the replacement of the the Kaiapu heat pump and other other similar units. Uh, look, I said it earlier, and I'll say it again. There's some horrendously important reports at today's uh, today's meeting, and um, quite quite frankly, uh, we're in for a really challenging time. Come uh, end of January, uh, we gave staff an indication of where we'd uh, like rates to be looking uh, going out, but quite, uh, I, I just can't see we're going to achieve that because this is another really important uh, report indicating investment. Um, so, uh, right, nothing more to say. Just, just to provide you some assurance, we're still working hard to try and get a rate picture that is one that you could support to the community. First two years, starting with a three, although a high three probably in later years, early fours, are probably what we are looking to bring to you in January and. Um, We'll be explicit in the briefing about what's in those numbers and what's out, but at the moment the numbers that you've got here are in the in the profile. The ones that we're talking about today sit in the in the profile that we'll be bringing to you. So we are working hard to get you a number that you can live with, which deals with these acknowledges these important issues. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, and remember that, like the previous item, there's lots of considers in here, so it's very much a considers rather than a commitment. Um, as when we get to the LTP, no, no. Uh, Robbie, write a reply. I'll put those that for that report then for adoption. All those in favour, say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. We are up to six point six cemeteries. Lindley. And uh, Marie, uh, Marie. Oh, mind you. Now in front of you. <laughs> oh, this year. <laughs> Somewhere. And Grant. And Grant, yep. Good afternoon. Um, this report um, is brought to you seeking your approval of the draft cemetery policy. Um, the updates have been done since the council briefing last week and we would also like you to appoint three councillors to sit on our hearing panel um, early next year. I think March, the week of March the 3rd um, is when that's scheduled in but I can confirm that. Uh, I will take the uh, report as being read. Um, I think the policy won't be a stranger to you and um, the uh, certainly we did um, address the uh, concerns that council had last week in updating this policy before it came to you today. <laughs> Mr Mayor I called you. <laughs> um, I, I would like to be part of that panel. Pass. Nothing. Nothing to add. Robbie. 
Well, that's pretty simple. Well, I'll move, I'll move that report for adoption. All those in favour say aye. Against. Carried. <laughs> why, could, why couldn't they have all shut up like that for the last hour? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Grant McLeod again. Um, to my right is Rhino Lachlan, who uh, handles um, a lot of the capital and operational planning within the Green Space team as well. Um, so I've just got Ryan here because obviously there might be a few questions just around how some of the budgets are, are going to be working. Um, just worth noting here within the Sports Facilities Plan update, uh, I'll take the report as read. Richard's given us an outline at the start of the meeting. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to discuss was the fact that the main change here is um, really around the timings of the budget that we're looking at. Um, one of the good news items here is that within the first three years we're actually looking at a reduction of capital cost, um, which is actually a reflection of a lot of the work that's happened to date over the last three years. Um, so you may recall in the last LTP, um, quite a significant amount of money was actually set aside for sports facilities. Um, that covered uh, a lot of things such as the Dudley lights, um, improvements to um, some of our uh, turfs, plus also we did um, went in with the Kaipoi High School as well and did some work with them too. So we've actually achieved a lot of the things that we set out to achieve and the biggest one being uh, Main Power Stadium mm -hmm. as well. Um, which came out of that, that report for, for need too. So look, you'll see there that the new revised budget is looking at, um, within the first three years, just the 265,000. Um, we do also note that out in years uh, 8 and 10 of the LTP, um, we're looking at a significant increase and really that's around the artificial turf renewals and replacements. Um, and that's purely the indicated figures that we believe we'll need at that point in time for that sort of technology. Um, that's because, in essence, we'd need to be uplifting um, not only the top surface of that, but then also the shock pads underneath as well, because they'll be reaching the end of their, of their life. Um, and this was one of the points that Robbie was making as well. We normally get this uh, paid back in to us um, by hockey and football. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, football haven't been paying those bills um, because they simply don't have the financial means to actually pay for the turf um, as much as they're using it. So look, I'll, I'll take it as read. Um, I'm aware that there's possibly a few questions on this one, so I'll hand it over. Oh, well, I have got, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, um, just looking through the um, 1.7, where um, for the indoor court facility, um, I just see that uh, netball are wanting to look at using it as well and also um, gymnastics, so are those, both the, the plates and everything going to go in beforehand for both of those? Uh, yeah, so it actually states there that um, okay. the, the progress update is that those plates will be inserted. Right, yep. so we'll get that in our next briefing. I, potentially, it depends once they're actually installed, they might just be ordered at this point in time for, for installation. Right, okay. I'd have to check with Craig around okay, exactly when that's, that's going in. Thank you. Just That was just a query that one. Thank you very much for this in-depth report. It's helping us to understand exactly what is required and needed. Um, 
and um, just looking at how you, you've budgeted each each item over the next three, you know, ten years. Um, it's just making us uh, appreciate just the amount of money that has to go into these facilities to, to keep them trucking along. So uh, thank you for that. Oops. Yes, thank you. It starts off with good news and um, the news gets worse as we get to the end of the period, the 10-year period. Um, just to echo what Robbie said, I, I would like to see some consideration given uh, to Kendall Park and what we can do with the artificial turf there. Um, it's not fair on other users who are paying their way if we have someone who isn't. So I'd like that given some consideration. Um, but apart from that, nothing else. Hey again, I'm just camping out here, I believe. Yep. Um, so look, this is in regards to our community facilities. You'll be aware that at this point in time we have an annual um, renewal program of around about $50,000. Um, what we're in essence looking at here is that Simon and Ish, um, with the help of Ryan as well, over the last uh, 12 months have actually been looking at an asset data capture for um, all of the facilities that we've got um, to determine the kind of work that we'd need over the next 10 year period. Um, the reality is is that we've got a lot more compliance measures that we have to meet, a lot more health and safety, a lot more fire regulations. Um, you'll note that with CUST, as soon as we went in there, we actually triggered a whole lot of things that we had to, that we had to do to bring the building up to code. Um, and that kind of, uh, I guess, forced our hand in terms of how much budget we had to attribute through to the work that we were doing there. Um, this is really a reflection of that. The community facilities um, have actually done really well, but gone are the days that we can get community groups to actually manage a lot of these for us and do the work that's required. Um, now we have to ensure that we're actually meeting quite a lot of building warrant of fitness uh, recommendations, that we're doing the compliance work that's required. Um, so hence that we're actually looking at an increased budget for this. Now, Ryan is here and he's going to uh, just very briefly articulate how the depreciation fund works in that regard. Thanks, Grant. Um, so as noted in the report, the funding for the renewals program um, comes from the Community Facilities Depreciation Fund. Um, this has already been calculated in the rates. Um, so the amount that we're increasing it by is not the total amount that we're taking annually. Um, that will build up um, um, well, build up over the years to um, renew the entire building um, once we get to that point. This is to do with the interior um, fixtures and fittings, the likes of heat pumps and other assets. So. Yes, and you'll note that in year one we've left it um, uh, half of what we've suggested for year two and three. The reason being that we wanted to have a lighter year within the first year of the LTP just to give us a little bit more uh, room to kind of get the market in order in terms of delivering what it is that we need but also to reflect the fact that we're going from 50k a year um, up to 150 so we didn't want to make that jump to 300 immediately. Happy to take questions. You got me again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the Sefton Community Hall. Um, councillors will probably be aware of the fact that we've had uh, quite a lot of meetings with the Sefton Community and Sefton Community Hall um, Committee actually looking at what their uh, options are going forward. Um, they've been doing a lot of planning with the committee with the community over the last few years. This is a non-council owned facility um, that sits on private land that the trust own. So with the help of um, Councillor Redman, um, they've actually been going through and doing quite a lot of work to both look at the community library that they have there, 
um, but also this bit of land as well to identify what the best um, the best option is for them to go forward. Uh, again, they worked through RSL consultants and did a feasibility study um, that came up with two options for them that they seriously considered. One was to remain on the site that they're on and repair the building. The other one, which has now become their preferred option at their last uh, meeting, is to move up to Sefton Domain. Um, in essence, what they would then be doing is uh, combining the pavilion facility within a new facility that's purpose-built on the domain. Um, what we're suggesting here is that we actually include a grant um, to that. Um, that really is kind of seed money, if you like, because it allows them to go out to other funders. They've got a quantum of money that they can access. Um, they're probably still needing to raise somewhere in the region of around about five to six hundred thousand dollars. Um, they've got around about three hundred thousand available to them. Um, with this grant here that would actually encourage other funders on board and we could make sure that this is much like the tennis one was that they've got to get the other funding before they can secure this one from us. Happy to take uh, questions on that one. Yes, thank you. Um, the old, old library, are they able to hopefully sell that? Or the land or what? Yeah, and I, uh, Phil, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, I'd but the like. last conversation that we had, I believe that they had been given the rights to do that through the, or they hadn't. Because it's been a struggle for them to, to get to the, even to this part, isn't it? Mm. Can I just make a comment here? I, um, I support, support what we're doing here. I just flag a risk around this project and that what is signalled as the average cost and the exclusions here is quite a gap from what we've just you've endorsed being a provision for inclusion for a similar size facility elsewhere at a significantly different quantum and there's a number of exclusions here so I hope, like heck, that they are able to secure funding and then get a project together for that quantum. If they can't, then there's a there's a there's a still a risk profile around it. Um, the square meter rate here is significantly lower than the square meter square meter rate we're applying elsewhere, and done by the same consultant. I would add. So something's one of them's not quite right or there's a significant level of service difference so I'd just highlight that there's still some risk around the, the financial envelope required albeit supporting a community group to do the best they can on uh, which is a good a good proposal if if I may Jim the um the difference would be a tremendous amount of level of service. So with the um, Ravenswood uh, proposal, really what they've kind of suggested there is because there would be library services, it's at a much higher level of service than what we could possibly see here. But again, that is a massive risk in terms of it is a huge difference in cost. Um, and because of the exclusions there as well, it, it very much will have a lot of risk involved there. Um, regardless of not building to the same level of service as a library, there are still some question marks around there until they have a detailed design, um, and we actually know exactly what that would be tended for. I'd, I'd note that, but I, keep, you know, and I don't want to debate it with you across across the table, but at Pegasus we're talking 2.7 million for 380 squares, which isn't a library, um, versus 1.3 or 4 here for a similar size facility, and so there is... There, 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 I'm just signalling there's, there's some further work yet to be done to finalise the cost estimates. Um, I'm very supportive of of this recommendation. I hear the 
words of warning about risk and costings. Um, this group, they're a good bunch that have been working very hard themselves for probably at least five years to try and make some progress. I had an email from the library uh, section, shall we say, yesterday and they're getting a wee bit frustrated that it has been five years and they still haven't been able to sell the library uh, and use those funds towards the hall. Um, I can say that the court has appointed living people as trustees for the library rather than long deceased people who haven't been here for a hundred odd years. Um, so that was the first step. Um, Helmore Stewart are uh, almost ready to file an application. They say it will be filed by the end of January with the court uh, that the library can be sold and the proceeds in terms of the trust applied towards a new community hall. So um, that'll probably be in the, hopefully in the first part of next year that will be heard. So I've no idea what the library is worth. They were talking 100,000 plus. So that will be money to go towards the project. A win-win would have actually been for the hall to be rebuilt where it is with the assistance of the Ministry of Education. But that avenue has been flogged to death and uh, there was no traction with the Ministry. So the community end up with a good result, but the school community end up with a less ideal result than could have otherwise been achieved. But I think this grant of 200,000 um, will go a long way towards helping the group. They'll have the sale of the existing uh, building and site, sale of the library, they've got their insurance proceeds, plus 200 from us, and fingers crossed that we may get a, a building in the domain. So um, I, I just think these people are to be congratulated for their persistence and perseverance and I'm more than happy to help them. Item, item 7, thanks Jim. Item 7 is now withdrawn because the Kaiapoi Community Board did not um, um, go ahead with the um, proposal for the for the stock bank steps for financial fiscal reasons. We don't we don't need to receive that then at all, do we? It just comes off the agenda. What? I think it went to, no, I can't remember whether the recommendation went to council as opposed to community and recreation. We have to have to receive it. Okay, yeah, well I'll move that we receive that. the item. Is that yeah. all we need to do? Seconder? Yeah. Wendy, all those in favour say aye, against, carried. Okay. Right, correspondence. Um, we have from, uh, from I know nothing about that. Do you know what that in correspondence was? We just received it? Yep, it's uh, from our regular early records saying that they're appreciative uh, of the grant which has enabled them to continue an operation. Thank you. I'll move from the Chair. We, we received that in information. Seconder. Wendy, all those in favour say aye. Against carried. Thank you. Portfolio updates. Um, go away. Paul Williams, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> um, you want to read that? Read Robbie's report? So, Robbie's got a number of bullet points here. I will try and read as rapidly as I can. Um, uh, Christmas trees put up in Rangiora and Kaiapoi. The wrap in uh, Kaiapoi had to be taken down due to wind damage, so we're looking for an alternative for next year. Flags installed in Oxford. Flags will be going up in Rangiora and Kaiapoi in the new year, plus a new flag track system, which makes it easier to change the flags and much more cost effective. Tree planting in the Rangiora Airfield Access Road, trees supplied by ECAN and 1200 were planted with help from volunteers from the airfield. Norman Kirk changing rooms, final works have been completed and expected uh, diamond, softball diamonds to be opened early in the new year with thanks for the work for the regeneration team. Currently have more inquiries for the marina and casual user has birthed there at the moment. 
ongoing discussions re pile moorings and pile and mooring owners uh, seek being planned for the installation at Arlington shopping complex before Christmas Memorial uh, Milton Memorial Park is out for consultation at the moment we'll be bringing an updated plan to the board in the new year the stand of Lombardi poplars have been removed from the Ashley campground they posed a health and safety risk so staff worked with the advisory group and got a contract to remove them safely Kaipoi BMX track maintenance due to be completed this week uh, first is the final treatment for the track as long been open first this is the first treatment the track has since opening is being well used so the work is being managed at a quieter time of the week and prior to the school holidays Pearson Park Pavilion damaged storage door being replaced has been a successful event with a variety of events occurring across parks network no incidents to report other than a few complaints following fireworks but this is being worked through with RPA um, Work on Mandeville and Terracartney toilets are continuing, expected to be completed by Christmas. Hiranui Reserve development is nearing completion, will be open to the public by Christmas. This includes a small sports goal planting and some balance items. Owen oh, Stalker Park design has been finalised, expected to go to tender in January 21. Community and community board were very happy with the concept plan, so looking forward to it being completed. Renewal of playground surfacing and equipment are continuing. Low burn irrigation progress. Uh, project is progressing with the club. The club have proposed a solution and are looking to lead the works. Initial design is underway on Good Street Redevelopment and workshop was held with the community board on the 9th of December at its meeting. Final work uh, was completed on the Kaiapoi Stop Bank artwork project, decking and seats installed around the ship's crane. And finally, the Cus Community Centre Shovel Ready Project painting has been completed and design is currently in progress for the roading aspect for this government funding expected to go to dis ten tender in December. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Well done. Speed reader. Your two portfolios. Sorry, um, first of all, we'd we just like to talk about the waiver fees. We had a committee that looked at the waiver fees, but um, we seem to be having so many coming through wanting their, their fees completely waived again. So we're going to have to have a, in the new year, have a good, serious look at how we work this a bit better than what it does, because it's certainly not working the way that we had hoped. Um, age friendly group, well, you've had your information regarding that, and um, just work in progress there, we just need to be moving on with that. Stadium Y Makarere, we had our meeting last um, in November and um, uh, I don't think, we're not won't be having another one until about February but uh, you would have got in the, hopefully, got through your emails some updated photos from, did you get that from, yeah, which is showing how quickly it's moving on which is very pleasing indeed. Um, Ashley Gorge Advisory Board, they're um, having a s tremendous success with the um, tracks that they have, that they've voluntary done themselves, which is a real credit. They haven't asked for any help from anybody. Um, and they're just wanting to, to go right up over the top, and um, I think it's about a 5k walk or something like that. I'm just not too sure now. But they've just got a few little issues that they've got to have a bit of private land that they've got to have which is dock land that they need permission to go and also there's a, a, a um, road there too which is just one of those unformed roads so they just have work to do on that one which is frustrating them a bit but it'll, it'll happen. Pension housing that's going well they've got um, quite a lot of work's been done on them and uh, the pensioners seem to be pretty happy with that. Um, going to Mandeville Sports Club tonight, they're going to launch their strategy plan to the, the team, so that's uh, really good to all the guests. So, and the CUST Community Board um, just want to know, not sorry, the CUST Community Hall, whatever they want to call themselves, are wanting to know why they are a neighbourhood, they're classed as a neighbourhood reserve that's not quite, their hall is not quite fitting with what they felt it should be. That was just passed on from another member. Thank you. And the other thing that I just really wanted to say was, also was, <coughs> um, 
you know, I did mention about Yvonne Palmer. Um, she has done tremendous work for Age Friendly and for um, uh, the road um, drivers, senior senior driving thing. And um, I'm just really sorry that she's unable to continue on with that through a serious illness that she's had. Thank you. My question is, when are we going to be able to have that that um, giraffe shifted into? Well, it, it, he's he's offered it yes. probably about eighteen months ago now, yes. and nothing's been done, and it's free of charge. He's going to install it himself. Yes. So, please. Oh.